This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week, we welcome back Dr. Joe Steebrook. We're going to talk today about the new book, Moisture Control for Residential Buildings, Our last show was a popular show on the life and times of the Dean of Building Science, our last live show, that is. We're back live this week with Dr. Steebrook. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They are the reason we can continue doing this show. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association at aiha.org the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at acgih.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute at cirscience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association at iaqa.org, the Restoration Industry Association at restorationindustry.org, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at iicrc.org and Healthy Buildings America 2021 at hb2021-america.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories at aemlinc.com, Particles Plus at particlesplus.com, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions at graywolfsensing.com, TSI Inc. at TSI.com, Sunbelt Rentals at sunbeltrentals.com, April Air at aprilaire.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry to report there was no correct answer to our last trivia question. So we've decided to recycle it. The IQ Radio trivia question for today, September 10, 2021, has been sponsored by TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for the monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IAQ Radio trivia question. Name the building-related nonprofit, non-governmental organization established by the U.S. Congress and the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974, Public Law 93-383. Back to you, Joe. All right. Dr. Joe Stiebrecht is the founding principal of the Building Science Corporation and an ASHRAE fellow. He's a building scientist who investigates building failures. His doctorate's in building science engineering from the University of Toronto. He's been a licensed professional engineer since 1982, and the Wall Street Journal referred to him as the Dean of North American Building Science. Dr. Stiebrook is an acclaimed educator who has taught thousands of professionals over the past four decades and has written countless papers. Welcome back, Joe. Great to have you here. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to hang with you and the Z-Man. Of course, <laughs> oh, in, great. Of course in Canada, he's the Z-Man. The Z man, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I grew up listening to ZZ Top, and I grew up with Z. Uh, I'm not familiar with that one, Joe. All right, we're, we're talking about the moisture control for residential buildings. There was a, a book originally in 1991, a revision in 94. Why are we writing a new book at this time, Joe? Well, um, the physics hasn't changed, but uh, our understanding uh, of what's going on has gotten better. And more significantly, um, the materials are very, very different. Um, We have an awful lot more engineered wood. And I view engineered wood as an insult to both wood and engineers. You know, OSB is spam of wood. (laughs) Spam is the OSB of lunch and meats. And and, uh, I, I remind people that we used to 
you know, go to forests and cut trees down and cut them into boards and build boats out of them and sail them around the world. Try doing that with a sheet of OSB. <clears throat> and the other thing is that we're uh, insulating up the wazoo, and that's a metric term. It's two yin yangs, and <laughs> uh, and uh, that uh, has significantly improved the thermal performance, but it has a huge negative impact on durability. And the reason is is that um, if things get wet and they subsequently dry, no problems, you know, wetting followed by drying, hey, relax, take a volume. But drying is an energy exchange. Um, so you can't have drying unless you have an exchange of energy. So what has happened to the drying potential of our buildings as we've increased thermal performance? It's crashed. So if you want to build a building with an exceptionally low drying potential because it's ultra insulated, then you have to reduce the wetting potential. So you have to stay in hydric or moisture balance. And so as we've doubled and tripled our thermal resistance and performance in both heating and cooling climates, we've had to double our ability to keep the darn things from getting wet. So, I mean, the, the easiest example is that there are only two kinds of windows in the world, windows that leak and windows that will leak. So what do we know about windows? Well, they leak, it gets worse. Windows are like people. As windows and people get old, we leak. I remind you youngsters, you have no freaking idea what's going to What's happening to you. So, um, in the old days, the we call that leakage incidental water. It's a leak in and to a, a wall assembly built out of thousand, thousand year old trees and rocks and it you know dried in both directions. You know, who cared? Now it, it, it's not able to dry and that incidental water is no longer incidental. So the industry has responded correctly. We completely pan flash the underside of our windows. So in other words, we we wrap the entire opening so that when that inevitable leakage of the window and the window to wall interface occurs, we direct the water to the outside. We basically say a, a leak is not a leak if the client never sees it and if it never doesn't, never doesn't get into the wall. So accept the fact that things are gonna leak, just kick the stuff out. And that's obvious and logical now, but it sure as heck wasn't obvious and logical uh, back in the 90s, remember synthetic stucco, EIFS? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it, it, water didn't go through the synthetic stucco. It went through where the stucco was connected to the windows and the windows themselves went through the punched openings. So in other words, oh my God, well, we never had to care about that before. Well, yeah, but now we have so little energy available and we're building out of materials that are moisture sensitive. Whoa, things are different. So, you know, um, after 30 years, um, the Department of Energy yelled at me and called me names and terrified me and said, rewrite the damn thing. So there you go. Beautiful. John, let's put up the table of contents for the new, new book. I think it's interesting how you broke it down, Joe. It's a little different than it was broken down in the past. It seems like a combination of the fundamentals and then the EEBA books, the, the climate zone books here. Um, you know, you go over the water molecule materials and mold, moisture movement, wall assemblies, roof assemblies, foundations, mechanical, and then through the climate zones. Why did you set it up this way? Well, it's kind of hard to give people advice if they don't understand what the advice is based on. So why not give a background into the key fundamental principles? And once you know the fundamental principles, all of the details become obvious. And the details are just guidance because then if you understand the principles, you can revise and modify the details based on your own individual constraint and experience and available materials. If you just say, here, do this, people are not going to know what they can change and what's important not to change. Um, so, and that, you know, that's it's called wisdom. It happens when you get older. <laughs> so I, <laughs> 30 years ago, I screwed it up. And so I fixed it. All right. So there you go. All right. Well, what you mentioned the most, what is the most important moisture concept or controlling moisture concept in residential construction? Well, except the fact that buildings are going to get wet and design them to dry. We, we got the focus wrong um, before. A lot of people also wanted to prevent wetting. And I said, no, no, we should encourage drying. In other words, the focus should be more on drying than on just the prevention of wetting because a lot of the concepts on the prevention of wetting prevent drying. 
So I want to reduce wetting, but I don't want to do it at the expense of reducing drying. And that, that only took a, you know, a decade or two for me to, but geez, you're an idiot. You know, it, you know, it's a balance, you know, wetting and drag. And so, I mean, the fundamental principle is, is when the rate of wetting exceeds the rate of drying, you have accumulation and you don't get into trouble until the quantity of accumulated moisture exceeds the moisture storage capacity of the material system or assembly. And that is time, temperature and material specific. That's it. That's, that's the summary of the entire freaking book. And I should have said that like 30 years ago, but I didn't, yeah. um, not, not clearly anyway. And so now it's like, okay, let's look at some of the principles. Well, what, what gets wet the most? Well, rain and groundwater. Well, what's the biggest rain source? Well, where the building touches the sky, <laughs> followed by where <laughs> the building touches the ground and then the sides. You know, and if you can't handle the rain above grade and the groundwater below grade, give up. Then you worry about air. You don't worry about air until you've handled rain. Then you don't worry about vapor until you've handled air. You know, that's the order. You know, do the important stuff first. So I, I, have, I have a lot of, lot of fun. I got uh, invited to um, uh, ABBA, the Air Barrier Association of America. And, and I was a keynote. They, by the way, they not invited me back. I mean, maybe they didn't like my humor. But <laughs> I said, why would you, A, name yourself after a bad Swedish musical group? And, 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 and B, um, you should have been called WABA, the Water Barrier Association of America, before you were called the Air Barrier Association of America, because all of your air barriers are really water control areas that have an air control function that's been added to it. So interesting. I, John. I, I got polite applause and uh, <laughs> nobody bought me a drink. And you know, here I am by myself again. <laughs> hey, John, throw up that first detail of the... Uh the climate zones, hydrothermal, wait, let's, let me, let me do it right. The hydrothermal regions as outlined in the book, Joe, why is this such an important detail in your book? Figure one, one, it must be important. <laughs> you know, okay. A building um, has to resist certain things. Um, it's an environmental separator. It keeps the outside out and the inside in. And um, what are the odds that it does things perfectly? Well, sometimes the inside gets into the thing that separates the inside from the outside and you have to decide to kick it back or let it through. And sometimes the outside gets into the thing that separates the inside from the outside. You have to decide whether to kick it back or let it through. And how much you kick back and let through in each direction depends on, on four things. The first is, where is the building located? That the external environmental load. That's what this map is. The second thing is, is what's, what's going on inside because that establishes the internal environmental load. The third thing is what are the materials that comprise the environmental separation? Are they rocks or are they was wood? And number four is what's the energy flow? So the very first thing that I wanna show is let's establish what the external environmental load is. And in Montreal, which is, you know, very cold. There are only two seasons, this winter and last winter. In Miami, there are only two seasons, hot and wet and hotter and wetter. Well, <laughs> you know, that might be pretty freaking important. So this is a map of, of, of what the external environmental loads are. And um, this map um, was stolen by ASHRAE and it became the ASHRAE guide. And then it became adopted by uh, the IECC and the IECC in terms of their climate zones. So you should ask me where I got it. <laughs> and where did you get it, Joe? I stole it. I stole it from. <laughs> I stole it from a long dead Russian. Uh, if you're going to steal stuff from a Russian, you better make sure that the Russian is dead. Um, this is a this is a variation of the Köppen climate uh, chart, and you have to laugh because. That was a base, that's basically a, on vegetation. It basically, it's a map of the plant kingdom on the planet. Uh -huh. so, and so I came to the conclusion that the plant kingdom was a better judge of temperature, rainfall, humidity than architects and engineers. 
Good, good. And then show the next one, John, because this is another interesting. I love this graphic of precipitation. Um, again, looking at, you know, what's the external load on the building? Give us a little more on this one, Joe. Well, I, you know, rain is important. There's a, there's a big difference between Salt Lake City and Key West, Florida, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Vegas versus Biloxi, Mississippi, right? You know, it, it, and so I, I said, look, let's, we need a, a temperature and humidity map, which was basically the first one, which is taken, stolen, borrowed from Copen. Um, and then I wanted one for rainfall. And, and so nothing exi nothing existed. So I you know, said, look, let's, I'll create my own map. And, and so I've got zero to 20 inches, 20 to 40, 40 to six, you know, 60 and above 60. And you should ask, well, well, why did I pick increments of 20? Because when I picked increments of 10, the map was too complicated. When I picked increments of 30, the map wasn't complicated enough. This felt right. <laughs> And so, okay. are you telling me? <laughs> I got this based on feelings. Well, yeah, it was the song, Feelings. Of your... <laughs> and so, this was uh, the uh, IECC climate zones, basically uh, moist, marine, and dry. Yep. It's based on this 20 inches of rainfall. So, I mean, I, I look at the code and I'm like, hey, that's me, baby. <laughs> and, 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 and it's kind of it's, it's kind of it's kind of neat. So you need to know uh, how much it rains and what temperature humidity there is. Now, I mean, there's more to building than just that. I mean, it's probably important to know <laughs> whether you're in an earthquake zone or a hurricane zone and wind loads and everything else. But you know, the, the structural engineering profession is very mature compared to building science. Right? We're 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 young. <laughs> They're Babies. old. They, they got this dialed in. Uh, that's why not much happens in structural engineering. Uh, that's why they're so boring. You want exciting. Talk to a building scientist because nothing works and we blame the architect. <laughs> John, let's go to the next detail we have on thermal bridging at a wall floor intersection. And, and I want to I ask you, Joe, why is thermal bridging seem to be becoming more and more important? <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you can't build an energy efficient building if you've got a thermal hole in the wall. That angle iron that supports that brick veneer is, 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 is probably responsible for almost half of the thermal losses. And it, it's funny, so let's you know, cover it with continuous insulation and the continuous thermal insulation is you know, gonna be, still doesn't affect the, the, the angle iron. So you lose almost 40% because of the thermal resistance of the angle iron or the thermal conductivity of the angle iron at, at the slab. So we've, we've, we've had to basically, to make this logically work, we have to take the angle iron and offset it, hang it off the wall on brackets to get any semblance of thermal performance in these buildings. So it's a BFD and, and you know, the, the F is from the president. Oh, understood. <laughs> Uh, Joe, well, let's talk about condensing surfaces. So what is the first condensing surface now in, in, in today's construction? Well, all right. It's always, it has always been, and it always will be the back of the sheathing. And I, 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 I laugh hysterically when people say, well, we're going to do a dew point calculation. And I'm saying, well, why? Well, we want to know where the dew point location is. Well, we always know where it is. It's on the backside of the dam sheathing. Well, no, no, the dew point temperature is reached in the middle of the fluffy insulation. And I'm saying, but you don't get condensation there. Huh? All right, you're gonna love this because we used to teach this in high school, <laughs> but not anymore. If I have one pound of water and I wanna change it one Fahrenheit degree, I have to add or subtract one British thermal unit, one BTU, right? Duh. Yep. Well, wait for this. Do you realize that you can have one pound of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and one pound of solid water or ice at 32 degrees Fahrenheit? Isn't that remarkable? And to change one pound of liquid water 
and to one pound of solid water at 32 degrees requires you to remove over 100 BTUs. Hmm. Whoa. Now it gets even interesting. So I have one pound of water in the vapor form and I wanna change it into one pound of water in the liquid form. I have to remove almost a thousand BTUs. Wow. One degree, one BTU versus a thousand BTUs. What happens is that when you have a change in phase, that energy has to go somewhere. And the fiberglass fibers and the cellulose fibers do not have enough thermal mass to handle the change in phase energy. You need a condensing surface with sufficient thermal mass to handle the change in phase energy for condensation to occur. Well, the first surface is the backside of the dam sheathing. We've never had to do the dam calculation. <laughs> if you actually read the fundamentals, it tells you that, but nobody reads this. This is amazing. You know, you're like, really? You know, the, the tell when you want to know if a mechanical engineer actually knows anything about building science or just calculating stuff is, well, we need to do a dew point calculation, in which case, you know, smile politely and look for somebody else. Wow. Joe, we, we're looking at moisture transport. That's the big thing. What are the four moisture transport mechanisms uh, that predominate in building science? Well, thank you for that softball question. It's like uh, being being the president being interviewed by ABC News. So this is <laughs> thank you very much. It's a BFD. <laughs> <laughs> number one, number one, it's, it's, it's rain and groundwater. All right, so it's we did that. Yep. Liquid flow. Number two is airflow because it transports an enormous amount of water in the vapor form. Number three is molecular diffusion, vapor. Vapor carried by molecules going from one place to another because of a concentration gradient, not molecules of water vapor being carried by air. Air transport for vapor is a hundred times, that's an order of two order of magnitudes, greater than by molecular diffusion. So you got vapor flow by diffusion. And then, then you basically deal with thermal conditions. So liquid water, air, vapor, and all of those are affected by the energy, which is the thermal. All right, John, give me that 313. I want to talk about draining the building and then what we call a screen assembly or what you refer to as a screen assembly. Joe, you know, this is one that you've been using for many years and, and I love it. I mean, it's basic, it's simple, but I think it's so important and a lot of people don't get it. Well, when, <laughs> when the water drops on the top of your building, you want to get the water away from your building. You want to drain the roof to the ground and slope the ground away from the building. Make the water go to your neighbor's property. Give them the grief, all right? Just layer mass the building in such a way that each successive attachment is designed to direct the water farther away. And, and man, this is only a 3,000 year old principle. So it's bound to catch on at, at Penn State. <laughs> Joe, Joe, go to the next one. I want to talk about screen assemblies, Joe. This is a roof intersecting wall. Uh, wait, is this? Yeah. Uh, there you go. Tell us a little more about the draining of the rain from the plane down and away from the building. As I recall, you used to say at one point, onto your neighbor's property, I forgot. Okay. Well, you, need to, you need to drain the rain on the plane. And don't be a dope slope. And if you want to save cash, flash. I've made a career out of those, all right? That's <laughs> three engineering degrees and, and you have three phrases. Yeah, that's, you know, there, 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 there you go. Um, Summarizes look, it all. The, the draining the wall is a big deal, which means you need a surface that doesn't have many holes in it. But it's not the holes that are the problem in the surface is that if you have a force to push the water through the holes, you get into trouble. And that's hydrostatic pressure. So if you provide a drainage gap, you don't build up hydrostatic pressure. So even though you might have nail holes and staple holes, you're not gonna have the water push itself because of its weight through the hole. The biggest issue is where you have, for example, a roof or a sloping roof, the water's gonna run down that intersection 
when it gets to the edge of the bottom of the roof, you need something to kick it away from the wall. You need a, a kick out flashing. And if you don't do that, you're gonna drain the entire roof into the wall. And the wall is not designed to handle that. <laughs> it's, it's called a wall, it's not a roof, all right? I, I, I know, it, I'm legendary, a wall is not a roof. There you go. <laughs> Although the perfect wall can be a roof. Yeah, it can be a roof. <laughs> but this kick out flashing, Joe, I, I've looked at hundreds of jobs. It's almost never there. Um, is it, how long has it been in code? If it is in code, why don't people do it? Well, um, it's not in the code, but it is um, in many regions now, something that we call the standard of care, which means it's a legal requirement. If you don't have it there, you'll get sued because they're gonna say, well, you're an idiot. You should have known you had it. And by the way, the majority of people in this particular area now do it and therefore you should have known. Um, they didn't do it in the past because you know, we had high drying potentials and we had materials that were robust. They were able to get wet. Now, this is another one of those sources of incidental water that is no longer incidental. So we've had to become very, very targeted in, in identifying where wetting occurs and kick the water out. Hence the word kick out flashing. Isn't it amazing how we name things in such a way that people will understand what their function is? Wow. <laughs> John, let's go to the next detail. I want to talk about what, what you're calling a screen assembly, Joe. I'm not, I don't, I'm, I'm just not that familiar with that terminology. Tell me what you mean by a screen assembly. Well, every cladding system leaks. Repeat after me, Joe Radio. Every, every, every cladding, cladding system <laughs> leaks. leaks. Every so, one. <laughs> every time one of them. And, and so what we need to do is provide a mechanism for the water that gets through the cladding system to be drained away. So we need a drainage layer, and I call that a drainage plane. But for drainage to occur, you can't smoosh, that's a technical term, you can't <laughs> smoosh the cladding directly against the drainage layer, you need a gap. So you need your drainage space. And that allows the water to drain out so it doesn't build up what we call hydrostatic pressure. And the cladding is now a screen as opposed to a barrier. It screens the water control layer, but it's not, and it's accepted, it's not intended to stop 100% of the rain. Um, then we need to drain the rain on the plane. Would you like to know where drainage plane came from? Sure. Came from me and Betsy, when I was dating her, we loved musicals. And one of our favorite musicals is My Fair Lady. In the middle of My Fair Lady, Eliza Doolittle says, the rain in Spain stays mainly we on the plane. the plane. I turned yeah. to Betsy and I said, we need to drain the rain on the plane. And she said, where's that damn rain? <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> and so the next day I presented to a builder's association meeting and drainage plane is now in the God darn code. Can you imagine this? So, you know, so I, I get cross-examined during court, you know, testimony sometimes and I get the judge and the jury laughing when you say, are you serious? That drainage plane came out of a musical? I said, yes, alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, John, put up the next detail. This is a, I, I think we have a screen assembly or a ventilated cavity example. Joe, this is a beautiful, it's so simple, but I, I see it wrong all the time. Well, I mean, here, here's the, the big deal with, uh, with, with, with brick. When it rains on brick, the brick gets wet. That's why we call it a, a reservoir cladding. You see, it's, you have to think of it as a moisture capacitor that is charged during a rain event. Then when the sun beats down on that brick, the water in the brick increases in temperature and the water is gonna to wanna to go from warm to cold. So some of the water in the brick is gonna to evaporate to the outside, but a whole bunch of it is gonna be pushed to the inside. And that's why we need a moving stream of air behind it to intercept that inwardly driven water vapor. It's called solar driven moisture. So we want to back ventilate reservoir claddings. Bada bing, bada boom. That's a 
the New Jersey version of, of ventilated cladding. So we run into these all the time that were done in the 50s, 60s, and the bricks right up against the exterior sheathing. It's uh, there's no uh, there, there's no air outlet or air inlet as you have it described here, which is actually I, I think you've added that recently. That nice little detail there with the uh, blue arrows. Um, people obviously aren't going to tear off all the brick in many cases. What's the fix, or at least an attempt at a fix, when we run into this and they've got the landscaping up over the bottom of the brick? There's no we poles, um, the bricks right next to the exterior cladding. How do we fix that? Well, you do what the Romans did. They stuccoed it. They reduced, uh, the water. they reduced the water absorption. Well, I don't like putting stucco over brick. Well, okay, well then paint the brick to reduce its water absorption. I don't like the color of the paint. Well, then use a, you know, silane or siloxane, which is basically a, a transparent water reducing agent to reduce basically the water absorption to reduce the reservoir we have options joe really well would you ever recommend actually putting in some weep holes and just you know trying to air it out that way well i, I call that faith-based ventilation <laughs> all right <laughs> i got you hey joe we're gonna stop we're going to thank our sponsors here real quick. When we come back, I want to talk about these water control layers in a little more detail. So we'll be back in 90 seconds with Dr. Joe Stebrook. <laughs> our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are... AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, at AIHA.org. ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, at ACGIH.org. The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, at CIRI science.org the indoor air quality association promoting the exchange of indoor environmental quality information through education and research at iaqa.org the restoration industry association the granddaddy of the restoration industry network with leaders at restorationindustry.org the iicrc a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry at iicrc.org and healthy buildings america 2021 in honolulu hawaii november 9 through 11 at hb 2021 america.org iaq radio industry sponsors are aeml laboratories free shipping great pricing same day results with no rush fee at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus, feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us at ParticlesPlus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, over 20 years manufacturing accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable, short term, and continuous monitoring at Gray Wolf Sensing. Dot com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations at TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals, availability, reliability, and ease for all your IAQ and restoration needs at SunbeltRentals.com. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at April A-I-R-E dot com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers at healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back for the second half of our interview with Dr. Joe Steebrook. Joe, I, I, I really quickly wanted to say, um, as far as 
moisture, uh, water control layers. Uh, just if you could give us some examples of water control layers, a uh, house wrap, that's a water control layer. What other examples? Well, the, the original one, the classic one was asphalt impregnated felt, tar paper. Um, it's kind of funny that Mississippi River divides the United States up into uh, the, 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 the half. The eastern half, um, we have asphalt impregnated felt. Um, the western half, we have type D coated paper. So believe it or not, we have two different types of black dinosaur impregnated or coated materials, but both of them are, are water control uh, layers. Then we developed the synthetic ones. Uh, the most famous was uh, Tyvek, but it wasn't developed for being a water control layer. <laughs> it was basically <laughs> a fabric. Uh, but I give DuPont an amazing credit for creating a market for a product that they didn't have originally a market for. Um, <laughs> then we got into um, fully adhered membranes, uh, peel and sticks, and uh, uh, WR Grace, um, Tremco, um, BASF, you know, a lot of the roofing fully adhered things ended up on, on walls. And then we developed fluid applied ones, liquid ones, uh, you know, paint applied water control layers. Uh, and, and more recently, most recently, we're now integrating the water control layer into the sheathings themselves. So for example, Huber Zip has got OSB with the green layer on it. And now you're dealing with joints. Um, um, Georgia Pacific has got, and USG has got gypsum board with a water control layer already integral with it. So now you're just dealing with with joints, so all of those are <coughs> are water control layers. We went from mechanically attached to fully adhered to fluid applied to now integral, and that process took I don't know a century and a half. Wow, interesting. Hey, let's uh, Cliff. Before I go, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, we have a couple of text questions. Joe, that I'd like to, to post to you. Uh, the first one is I was asked to ask you about magnesium oxide and other alternative materials like fast wall and Duracell ICFs, which seem to handle moisture more effectively. Do such flow through vapor permeable materials have benefit and a future? Um, magnesium oxide board has a history of being extremely unreliable because of acidity. And we had tens of thousands of square feet of roof failing. Um, I believe that the Germans and the Irish have figured out how to deal with the chemistry, um, but it's still, you need to be careful. Um, I, now that I've qualified for Medicare, I'm very conservative. <laughs> in terms of uh, the flow through materials, in terms of um, vapor flow, for example, um, you don't want to be too vapor open. You want to, you want to, you know, be Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, just right, not too vapor open, not too vapor closed, just right. Because if you are too vapor open, you will have inwardly driven moisture. And if you are too vapor open, you will have outwardly driven moisture. And um, you might wanna slow things down, not stop them. So I'm a, I'm a, let's slow down a little bit and you know, not whoosh, let's, you know, that's an old guy talking to you, all right? Okay, well, the second question is, I was asked to, query you about something called buffalo pelt and uh, where fur should be put and so on and so forth. So <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> All right. I used to tell jokes when 35, 40 years ago when I first started and about, you know, when you are riding in a carriage pulled by a horse and you're wearing buffalo skin, shouldn't the fur 
be to the outside or to the inside? And so the short answer is, is that from the you know, fundamental principles, you should have the skin on the outside and the fur on the in inside. And the, the, the punchline of the joke was the, the guy driving the, the, the carriage says, well, wow, I'm just shocked that, you know, all those buffalo I had it wrong for all these years. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Joe, going back to the, uh, the vapor control, it seems to me that craft face fiberglass insulation was ahead of its time and didn't know it. Um, or did they know it? I am not sure. I've been asking that question uh, over many drinks with many of the old people who a lot of them are now dying on me. And I, 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 you know, I'm running out of people, old people to ask that question. So the craft facing is, was what we call the first generation smart vapor retarder. It changed its vapor transmission with relative humidity. So for example, under a dry cup test, uh, it's one perm. Under a wet cup test, it's almost, it's almost 20 perms. So it's like a, a valve that opens and closes with respect to relative humidity. And the question is, is did they know that? And um, some, a lot, some of the old people did know that, but I don't think it was designed that way. In other words, it was an accidental byproduct that turned out to be quite spectacular. So an accidental, an, an accidental property that people didn't know when they first made it, but when we began to figure out how things were working, it was like, oh, wow, this is absolutely awesome. And so the, the, way, the reason that it was so nice is that back in the day, in the winter time, uh, in most North cold climate houses, the interior relative humidity was 20%. So the valve was smooshed closed. And the summertime, the humidity went up to 50 or 60% inside and the valve opened. So in the wintertime, the wall was prevented from getting wet from the inside. In the summertime, it could dry in both directions. Well, the craft facing is no longer a good idea because we're significantly increasing the interior moisture level in the houses in the wintertime. So we're basically uh -huh. prying open the valve all the time. So we needed to, to shift the hook or the inflection point farther to the humid, humid side. And so we now have the second and third generation smart membranes, which um, are vapor closed until you get to 50 or 60% relative humidity, and then they open up. So, but that was designed into those materials. And, and uh, the person you have to thank was uh, uh, Hartwig Kunzel from the Fraunhofer. And you should ask him over beer how he came up with it. And well, I'll tell you, anyway, he was figuring out what is, what's, you know, his father is a famous physicist, a PhD, a doctor, and he's in graduate school and he wants a topic to figure out, you know, what am I going to do my doctorate on? And he, and he got depressed. He went to the beer hall and he's ordering a beer and eating sausage and he's poking at the sausage casing. And he's noticing that on one side of the sausage casing, there's bubbles over there. And on the other side of the sausage casing, there is bubbles over there. And he wanted to know why. And that turned into his doctoral dissertation. And that turned into the first smart membrane. And so when you look at Intello and membrane, the original derivation was a sausage casing in Germany. Think about sausage casings. <laughs> That's interesting. I'm glad I asked that, Joe. Uh, let's let's go. I want to I want to real quickly look at pan flashing pan flashing approaches. Three twenty three, John. This is another thing that, like you said earlier, it wasn't maybe as important in older construction as it is today. Can you quickly run through the approaches here? And then, then I'd like to go to the uh, drained window and door openings. Well, um, basically what we have here is that we're creating this under window uh, gutter. Um, the most recent addition to this, there should have been, there should be a fourth uh, uh, piece and that is uh, fluid applied, right? Mm. And, and the idea is that we're creating an under window gutter so that when the window inevitably leaks, we collect that water and kick it to the outside. And so what we basically have are a back dam and we have end dams and we wrap it around the face to connect to the water control layer on the exterior part of the sheathing or the sheathing itself. This is a, 
a really, really big deal <laughs> now that yeah. we have OSB and an awful lot of insulation in the wall assembly. All right. So the listeners are hearing a little background noise, which is perfect. I don't know how you do these things, but apparently you decided to have them come today so we could make them part of the show. Uh, Joe well, is getting windows replaced. Well, you have to understand that I'm thrilled that somebody shows up. Okay. I would have blown, <laughs> I would rather blow you off. Than people <laughs> coming to the, do you have you any idea how difficult it is to get anybody to do anything now? Oh, I know Joe. I'm a, con- my oh. son's a contractor. It's, I it's insane. So. Okay. So, you know, everybody yeah, let's go to the next detail while we're doing there, right? <laughs> So, what, what I want to ask, John, go to the next one, if you would. What I want to ask is when you're replacing windows right now in the background, we hear that noise. What tips would you give people who are having window replacement done? And, you know, we see how it's done all the time. They, they stick it in the hole and they cock it and they hope for the best. What are we doing uh, differently in your current remodel and how can we do this better? Well, I'm okay. I'm going to pat myself on the back. I'm doing it exactly the way that I did it 20 years ago because 20 years ago I did it correctly. Um, uh, and but it's now more or less standard practice. I'm changing out the windows because I got shitty windows, but the window to wall interface is pretty is pretty darn good. The, the key element is you put in your pan flashing. We've already talked about that. But what people forget is you need a four sided air seal on the inside that big red dot on the inside. It needs to be tighter than a Scotsman in a bar, all four sides. Because when the wind blows against your wall, the inner seal causes the air to back up so you don't get wind-driven rain into that space. Then on the outside, you basically seal the sides, the jams and the head, but not the bottom. And the reason you don't want to seal the bottom is we want the water to do what? To drain out the bottom. So you want pan flashing, a four-sided interior air seal, three-sided seal on the exterior, and drain the rain, baby. And oh, by the way, slope it. Don't be a dope slope, eh? No. Yeah. You see that beveled wood in there, that piece of beveled wood siding? That's, that's going to be your slope, I think, on this one. How do we... Yeah, Joe, I'll tell you, my son does remodeling. And and if I tried to get people to do this right, uh, we'd never get a job. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's a it's a tough situation where um, the, the people trying to do the right thing is it's just so much more costly than, you know, the Anderson window, uh, nothing against the Anderson window, but the ads they have on every day about replacement windows and how cheap they are. Well, so, I... Uh... I'm going to get into trouble for this, but what the hell? I mean, you know, I, I we live for that. <laughs> I'll call me names. Um, the most effective technology transfer mechanism in construction is the legal profession. Right. So lawyers are going to be teaching the window installers the right way to install the windows because yeah. they're not working and nothing nothing changes practice than getting your butt suit. So uh, we need more attorneys. Oh, wow. I never thought I'd heard you say that. <laughs> John, let's go to 328. I want to talk basements for a minute. And just, you know, foundations, basements. In this case, we're talking about a basement here, Joe. It's a great detail. I like the way this was, was put together here. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about basement construction and some of the key points here. I want you to know that all I did was take a 2000 plus year old Roman method and uh, added color to it and new materials. So the big thing is collect the water that hits your roof and direct it away from your building. What you don't want is you don't want surface water and rainwater to become groundwater. So the strategy number one is Try to limit the amount of surface water that becomes groundwater. I mean, slope the ground away, drain your roof away from your building and put a impermeable layer, a cap right at the grade to try to make it as difficult as possible for the water 
to get into the ground. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two is assume that you've completely, totally failed strategy one. And strategy <laughs> one is you do everything you freaking can. And strategy two is assume that it didn't work. Then what you want is you want the water to drain vertically downward faster than it can go horizontally. So you want a free draining layer. The Romans use rocks without fines. And you collect that water at the bottom with a perimeter drain. And the drain should be on the outside, not on the freaking inside, on the outside. And it should be lower than the floor inside. That's it. It's the Roman water management strategy. Not and, much you know, has changed. It, and, you know, people argue with me about this all the freaking time. And then, all right, fine. We're not going to put the free draining stones. And so the biggest innovation is that you can actually take a dimple board, you know, like Dorkin's drain mat or whatever, and, and you can compress the, you know, three feet of stone into a half an inch airspace that does in essence the same thing. So control surface water and then control hydrostatic pressure by draining the water down to a drain and draining it away. Now, you drain to daylight if you can, so gravity works, or to drain it to a sump with a pump. But the pump runs on something called electricity. <laughs> and guess what? When it, you need it the most, <laughs> and you have a storm, it's the gone. power is out. Yep. So you need a battery. So if you're going to have an electric sump pump, which is going to be electric, have a battery. And if you don't have a battery, I'm going to hunt you down and talk sternly to you. <laughs> hey, John. It works, it, it, work, it works with the Taliban. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stern talking. To <laughs> <laughs> John, go to 3.30. Yeah, I think this is it. Now, you mentioned keep the drain on the outside. Obviously, that's preferred. In some cases, for whatever reason, people don't want to hear that. It's maybe difficult to do. Here's the way you design an interior drain. Yeah, we, we, we do tunnels this way. The, the Swiss, this is the Swiss method of doing a tunnel. Um, so you put your drainage on the interior. Of course, the Swiss didn't, didn't, didn't advise the people who did the big dig in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were retrofitting the drainage on the interior. I, 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 God, I, I love Boston. I, I mean, I, I, you know, what can I tell you? So yeah, if you can't dig up the outside, um, it may not be economical. You can't get at it, all kinds of stuff. The next best, not the best, but the next best is you drain it on the interior and put in your own perimeter drain on the interior. And we, we do this a lot because it's often the only, only option. The, the historic people get, you know, on the structural engineers, well, if we have brick and rubble, the mortar is going to be deteriorated. We don't want the water running through the whatever. And, and, I have to explain to them that they don't really understand the material science that's going on. The reason that the mortar deteriorates is not because the water running through it, because the water running through it is carrying salts with it. And you get crystallization, you get efflorescence and subfluorescence. And it's the evaporation of that water that leaves the salt behind that destroys it. So if your drainage layer is a vapor barrier and it's sealed at the top, the airspace goes to 100% relative humidity, which means that you don't have evaporation and therefore you don't have crystallization. You still have drainage, but you're not damaging your mortar. Okay. All right. John, let's go to the next detail. I think what we were talking about here. Oh, um, the interior air control layers. Joe, I just thought this was a, an interesting approach and interesting detail here. Can you tell listeners a little bit about this? Well, I, in the 82, 83, 84, when I was up in Canada, you know, you had a, a cult running construction. It was the, the cult of polyethylene where they wanted to wrap everything in a plastic condom and have it an air barrier and vapor barrier. And I was going to rot. And so I said, why don't we have a drywall condom as opposed to a plastic polyethylene condom? So I turned the interior drywall into the air control layer by simply gluing it. 
So the red lines are caulking and sealant that turn the drywall into the air control area. And that was my, became my master's dissertation, my first real big contribution to the industry, which was the airtight drywall approach. Now, having the air barrier on the inside of the framing is not as good as having it on the outside. But having a rigid air barrier on the inside that's semi-vapor permeable is better than having a plastic sheet that's completely vapor closed. So this is an improvement over poly, but it's not as good as putting you know, your, your air control on the outside in the form of your gypsum board with paint on it or Huber zip and covering that with continuous insulation or having an inch and a half of Dow styrofoam taped and all of the air barriers approaches on the outside are way better than any of the air barriers approaches on the inside. This one was better than poly, but not as good as everything else. John, go to 343 if you would. This is another indoor air control layer. I just thought I want to point out a little little different detail here, Joe. Well, this is uh, basically a section of what you just saw. Yeah. This is the airtight drywall approach. So okay. I'm basically sealing the ceiling drywall with caulking to the top plate, sealing the bottom drywall to the bottom plate, sealing at the rim joist, and then, you know, so basically I'm turning the interior lining into the air control layer, connecting the ceiling drywall to the concrete foundation. Um, I like to do this now on the outside, but in 82, 83, um, I wasn't smart enough to put it on the outside. I was young. Yeah, he's 26 years old. Jesus. I mean, <laughs> you know, Joe, how much is that catching on the exterior insulation? I mean, I see it. Not as much as I would like, but I do see it. It's the uh, it's the future. It's it's all over the code now. In twenty twenty one, you're not going to be able to build without having a continuous insulation layer on the outside, or go you know passive house with a double wall. Um, yeah, <laughs> the days of single studs with no insulation on the outside are, are oh, it's, it's gone, gone, baby, gone. Not happening. Not if you're actually serious about, you know, gee, we're going to be net zero by 2030, 2050, 20, never, I don't know. Every, every week I hear a new, a new, a new goal, but I'm saying none of that is possible without doubling your thermal resistance. But that also um, increases the air tightness and makes source control more important. I wish you could, could talk a little bit about source control of interior moisture, but also <laughs> other issues. Well, I, I became famous for saying dilution is not the solution to indoor pollution. <laughs> you heard that? Have you not heard that, Joe? Absolutely. <laughs> I read it again. <laughs> dilution is not the solution to indoor pollution. Um, source control is the only way to go. And uh, the problem, if you're trying to increase dilution um, with more air change, that kills you in the summertime and, and hot, humid and mixed humid climates because you're bringing in humidity and moisture is a contaminant. And um, I gotta let you in on a little secret. Um, in the old days, air conditioners were dehumidifiers. Yeah, but they only dehumidified when they were running. I know, that's why I'm a genius. They were only, <laughs> they were only dehumidifying when they were running. Well, what have we done to the runtime of the air conditioning system? We've dramatically reduced it. Well, why? Because we're ultra energy efficient. We got compact fluorescent lights. We got LED lighting. We've got windows that have an SHGC of 0.2, for gosh sakes. We got insulation in our wall. I mean, it's like, and now they don't run. And so let's bring in more air. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. You, you need a dehumidifier. And so, I mean, I ASHRAE 62.2 hates me because I tell them that they're overventilating. I said, build tight, overventilate right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm saying you, gotta, you have to have a dehumidifier. And so uh, you get excessively humid in the South. In the winter up North, you get excessively dry. So you need a humidifier. So I'm telling people, you know, here's, you know, I'm calling up Warren Buffett and George Soros, and I'm saying, here's some dehumidifiers. And yeah. by the way, maintain the humidity, you need an ERV, an energy recovery ventilator. 
So they're saying, well, you need an ERV in the south and a HRV in the north. And I'm saying, not anymore. We're ventilating at such a high rate up north. <laughs> you need to retain the humidity. So ERVs everywhere. Humidifiers, ERV. dehumidifiers, yay, invest. And send me and buy me a drink after you get your, you know, your your stock bonuses. I I hear you, John. But uh, you know, even here, I'm I'm in climate zone five. I'm up in the mountains of uh, of Pennsylvania. Here, I've I've got to run a dehumidifier pretty much, you know, not year round, but starting in April until probably October. Well, yeah, and and so let's bring in more air. Yeah, <laughs> that that's going to make it work. Well, we yeah. need the air because we have too many contaminants in the building. Don't build out of stinky, smelly, disgusting stuff. Don't fill your house with smelly, disgusting, stinky stuff. And don't do smelly, disgusting, stinky things in your house. I know. I, I, I'm a legend. You paid a lot <laughs> of money pointing out the obvious over the years. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, I, was, I, was, I was taught by legends and and i um unfortunately most of them have, have passed they adopted the young snotty bratty nosed kid and and tried to keep him out of trouble and 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 i i tried to do the same with youngsters now myself i it's called paying it forward because of how they looked after me and the old old ones basically said source control for the building ventilation only for people so you ventilate for the odors generated by people and everything else is source control. Um, uh, there's a famous saying that uh, one of the guys that taught me was David Hill, who you might remember. Uh, he said that people are, are evap evaporatively cooled, unvented combustion appliances. Mm -hmm. And that um, we burn a hydrocarbon fuel called food and we generate carbon dioxide and water vapor and odors. And, where do we vent? I don't, sometimes we backdraft. <laughs> we, those yeah. odors and, and whatever I need to be handled. And the person that figured out how much we actually needed was a guy by the name of Yagalu from uh, Harvard in the 1930s. And basically somewhere between five and 10 CFM per person to handle odors. And that is the ventilation rate that we should have for people. And then everything else should be source control. And, uh, well, believe it or not, um, that was taught to me, 82, 83, 84, and we still don't get it. I mean, you know, now with COVID, they're talking about doubling the ventilation rate and increasing the interior humidity. Man, I'm never going to be able to retire. <laughs> <laughs> John, let's go to the roundup. The Roundup is brought to you by April Air, providing healthy humidity, ventilation, and air purity solutions for new and existing homes. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at aprilaire.com. It's like we're going to make April Air a very successful business, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they're actually nice people, too. I mean, uh, it's nice to have a company that does good stuff that's also the people in it are, are nice. I struggle sometimes where I don't like the people, but I like the product. So, you know, I just suck it up, you know. <laughs> suck it up and use that product. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Final thoughts, final questions. Uh, just a final comment. Uh, thank Joe, thank you for, for joining us. It was another great show uh, and memorable and, and you are a legend. Uh, one update, uh, Healthy Buildings 2021 has been moved to January 18 through 20, 2022. Still in Honolulu, uh, right? Yeah, it's yes, still sir. in Hawaii, but the government wouldn't allow an event that size. So it's yep. just been moved back a little. Yep. Good stuff. Um, Joe, before we go, final thoughts. Uh, by the way, for the listeners, I, we just scratched the surface of the book here. I tried to get through some of the key points in the first three chapters. I didn't even get to touch on HVAC, although Joe, you brought it in real nicely with uh, some of the discussion about, you know, how, how little it runs anymore. Any final thoughts for our listeners? Yeah. Don't, don't let the COVID stuff 
freak you out. There'll be some good coming out of it. So for example, I really believe that uh, four or five air changes per hour in a room with air that's filtered with the MERV 13, MERV 14 filter is a smart play. You can get rid of the nasty stuff with filtration without having to bring in a whole bunch of outside air. All right, so we can do that. We can do that now. The concern that I have is, you know, people are, are going to crank up the humidity and a lot of the buildings are not going to be able to take it. And so my advice is do the lesson that we learned with the commercial buildings 25, 30 years ago, where we control the interior humidity based on outside temperature. So when the outside temperature drops below 20 degrees, for example, we reduce the interior humidity accordingly based on what the building itself can handle. So we don't simply say it's gonna be 45% relative humidity all winter. It might be 45% relative humidity for half of the winter. The other half of the winter, we're gonna control it based on the outside temperature. And I think that's gonna be the way that we're gonna be able to not destroy our buildings while we're dealing with the, with the humidity and everything else. So that's my message. Now, um, I've not been invited to <laughs> share this with anybody. <laughs> So I, summer camp next year, April or August 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. I'm going to share this with 500 people over beer and barbecue, and you're going to be our cult. You'll be the cultists to tell people that you don't overventilate, don't overhumidify, but overfilter. Great stuff, Joe. Thanks again for joining us. We always appreciate it and uh, hope all's well up your neck of the woods and looking forward to next year's summer camp. Two thumbs up, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joe Steenbrook, for joining us. Dr. Joe, thanks to our guest this week. Also to the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick, for his help, as always. To John, you got to have faith at the controls. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. Hey, next week, we got Paula Shank on. We're going to talk to you about uh, from the University of Connecticut. We're going to talk a little bit more about COVID. So please come back and join us next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 